Now then, how are you doing? I hope you're well. Over the years, I've been fortunate enough to be given the task of running onboard painting classes on many cruise ships. And I've enjoyed adventures to many different parts of the world as a result. I feel particularly privileged to have done so, knowing that I might never have had the opportunities to visit many of these places that I've been to otherwise. This is the story of one such adventure, a circumnavigation of South America, and one that holds many treasured memories for me that I'd like to share with you. It's a story that I'll be telling through footage shot along the way, with extracts from my journal and, of course, through the medium of watercolour. I hope you enjoy it. adventures start out with anticipation. Cruise journeys start with the chaos of embarkation. Only when everyone is safely on board can the voyage truly begin. It was a cold evening in January when we left the port of Avonmouth in Bristol to begin our long voyage around South America. When it's cold and dark like that, the anticipation seems all the greater for it. I quite like the business of ports, particularly busy ones where there's a lot of coming and going, container ships being loaded, huge crates of food for the journey. At the start of an adventure though, all you really want to do is to get going. first port of call after leaving England was Lisbon, the capital city of Portugal. It's an interesting city with an interesting seismic history, old buildings and distinctive trams that whisk visitors through old steep streets. The weird memorial fountain located at the top of Edward VII Park always brings to mind the phrase, it'll be nice when it's finished. The view from there down to the city is quite spectacular though. As an onboard tutor, I also get to escort a few shoreside tours. Lucky me! On this occasion, my escorting took me to Cascais, just up the coast from Lisbon. Historically, a summer retreat to the Portuguese nobility, the Cascais of today is a popular tourist destination for all Portuguese, no matter how much land they own. It has a fort and a harbour full of fishing boats and the one hour free time we were given there wasn't too painful at all. On the way back to the port, we paused for a photo stop at the Monument to the Navigators. It's an impressive 52 metre tall monument resembling the prow of a caravel that commemorates the many discoveries of Portugal's most famous explorers. 
pole position at the front of the line is taken up by Prince Henry the Navigator, who discovered the Azores, Madeira and Cape Verde. As statues go, it certainly beats the one at the top of Edward VII Park. But what do I know? port of call was Funchal on the beautiful island of Madeira. First time visitors should aim to do two things. One is to take the cable car up to Monte and the other is to come back down the hill on one of the famous toboggans. A great tourist experience not to be missed. Note that they only bring you halfway down the hill though. Having done the sledge run once before, on this occasion we opted for a short adventure of our own, hiking along a series of new footpaths that meander across the hillside before navigating several steep roads back down to the town. It felt like an adventure because the local tourist information centre had insisted the footpaths didn't exist at all and we only had a few hours to complete the walk-in, it being only a morning visit. We made it though and the views were spectacular. We have a long way to go and the excitement of arriving in a port is often matched by the anticipation of leaving it with thoughts of our next destination in everyone's minds, leaving Madeira didn't feel sad at all. From Madeira we headed almost directly south to Gran Canaria, the third largest of the Canary Islands, roughly 100 miles off the coast of North Africa. It's only a relatively short walk from the port through the town of Las Palmas before you reach a long sandy beach with its multitude of welcoming cafes and bars. We walked the length of the promenade to a point where the sandy beaches were replaced by rock pools and surfing waves and enjoyed what was left of the late afternoon sun. There would be two sea days, two days of running workshops for me before our next port of call. When you're on a cruise ship every port stop is special but you also have to keep a constant eye on the time. No ship will wait for latecomers and it's a long way to Cape Verde. Just time for an ice cream on the way back to the port then.
Ten days after leaving Bristol, we arrived at our fourth port of call, Mindelo, on the island of St Vincent in the Cape Verde Islands. The walk into town from the port took about 20 minutes, and boy was it hot. Aside from its arid climate, there are a couple of things worthy of note. Firstly, Mindelo is a very colourful place. We've also always found it to be very friendly, despite occasional mumblings from fellow passengers. This colourful and slightly chaotic quayside fish market is a good example of the kind of activity visitors are likely to come across. The other thing that's always fascinated me about Mindelo are the old fishing boats always to be found lined up on the small beach in the bay. I say old, they're clearly very well looked after and in constant use despite the patchy paintwork. Most of all, it's the textures that attract me to them which make them great subjects for paintings. Drawing boats can be surprisingly tricky. Despite the fact that we know their sides curve equally from front to back, it's important to draw it as you see it. The far side, for instance, appears as a straight line compared to the near side where the curve is particularly prominent. The rule is simple, draw what you see and not what you know is there. Applying even just a single blue-grey colour is enough to establish its three-dimensional credentials. With the light coming from the left, it means the whole of the right-hand side of the boat is in shadow. I've used alizarin crimson and Prussian blue for the two main colours of the boat, but it's when I get to the burnt umber, a colour signifying wear and tear, that things start to get really interesting. I'm softening off the small patches along the back, drawing the paint downwards to suggest rust and grime. In watercolour, we work from light to dark. Also, tone is relative. The lighter and brighter we want something to appear, the darker the adjacent value needs to be. Here I'm applying an intense dark colour mixed from French ultramarine and burnt umber. It's worth noting, however, that the places where I don't apply the paint are just as important, if not more important, than the places where I do apply it. Which brings me to all those lovely textures. The beautiful thing about decay is that it happens randomly. Generating the random element, however, is one of the hardest things we have to do in watercolour. I like to let the brush be my guide, applying the paint as randomly as possible, avoiding repetitive patterns as much as possible, and then softening the brush marks off with a damp brush to blend them into the surrounding wash. The unpredictable nature of the medium goes a long way towards maintaining that random natural finish. Softening off also helps to maintain a degree of subtle realism.
finally, when it comes to the lettering on the side of the boat, I like to carefully scratch it out with the blade of a craft knife. The result is a little on the rough side, but that fits in with the nature of the subject. For more intricate lettering tasks, I would probably reach for the masking fluid, or, dare I say it, white paint. As the sun set on our full day in Mindelo, so our time in the Cape Verde Islands was nearly done. We had just one more stop to make the next day, a half day in Praia de Santiago. That's the big money shot. <laughs> Hello Ian. Hello. <laughs> if you're looking for a taste of local atmosphere, always head for the market. This one was a cacophony of voices and a myriad of colours. Women walked around nonchalantly with huge packages of stuff balanced impossibly on their head. And the noise of sub-African commerce was almost deafening, but also quite exciting. We liked Praia, it was just a shame we didn't have longer to explore. Which brings us to the end of this first leg of our journey, before setting off across the Atlantic towards Brazil.